I love the presence of God. I said, I love the presence of God. Do you? Do you really? Great. We'll see you at 6 o'clock tonight. You know, I have, uh, for, for all the years I've done ministry, I've heard people talk about, I need this miracle, I need that miracle, I need this miracle. And you have a prayer meeting and they're nowhere to be seen. Man, when you set yourself to seek the Lord, God will respond. Amen? And it's going to get better from here. But come be with us tonight at 6. I want to share with you uh, this morning, and probably this will be the last full message I preach to you as the lead pastor of this church. I'm going to be back uh, by invitation on October 10th. I expect you to be here. Uh, But I want to lay a little foundation for you. In 1986, I was preaching a multiple-week revival in Augusta, Georgia. And Becky and I had been having conversation about how we felt like the Spirit of God was changing our hearts and the direction of ministry. And we'd talked to no one else about that. I think David was probably about five, about to be six. And I was sitting after service that night. There were several local pastors that came to the worship service. And I was uh, sitting around a dining room table after the service in the pastor's home uh, with several pastors. And uh, as we concluded our time of fellowship and everybody was about to leave, there was a man sitting to my right. I have no clue what his name is. I wouldn't know him if he was in this room. But he took me by the arm just as we were standing up to leave. And he said to me, I feel like God is giving me something for you. Can I share that with you? And I said, of course. And he spoke these words to me. I wrote them down. I had no idea at that moment in time in 1986 the depth of what he said to me. But he said, the Lord says I'm changing your heart and your direction. I will give you a vineyard. And after the course of time, I will give you another vineyard, and I will bless that vineyard, and it will become a large vineyard, and the broken will be mended there. So I wrote that down, and it was put away inside of books or files, and I wanted to remember that. I had no idea the depth of that word in 1986. And then it seems like yesterday in 1992, I stood to preach the first message at the El Paso Drive Church of God. I preached out of Luke chapter 5 about breaking nets and sinking ships, which I've said to you often, and nobody remembers that unless I tell them. But I remember because it was prophetic and it was something God put in me. And 28 years ago, I was sitting in my office talking with a lady. In the course of our conversation, she told me about a Catholic ministry in Columbus that had gone defunct. And she said the name of it was the Potter's House. And when she said that, something jumped in me. And I I stopped her and I said, wow, that's going to be the name of this church one day. And she kind of smiled and went on with her story. But that was a profound moment for me. And God began to piece this together. And then in January of 1995, I was praying uh, just at the end, probably in late December, early January. I was praying, asking God for direction uh, to cast vision in January for the church. And I'm not a person that has visions all the time. I've, I've had maybe three in my life. And God began to show me something. It was as vivid as you are sitting in front of me this morning. I saw, and at that time we were worshiping down the street, and I saw those brick walls breathing. They were moving, pulsating. And inside the the room was full and people were shouting and rejoicing and praising the Lord. There was celebration and music. And I looked outside and there was a man. I've often thought of having an artist try to 
to paint this or sketch it. But I saw a man with tattered clothes on with his hands in his pocket and his head down. Couldn't see his face. Had a hat on. And I saw a dark figure on the outside of the wall pushing the wall back in. And as I saw that, I, I, I said, we have to move and remove that dark figure that's pushing back. And I heard the Spirit of the Lord say, you reach to the broken man and I'll fight the dark figure. And what I'm trying to get you to understand, we didn't just become the potter's house because we were looking for something different. We didn't steal this name from another church. This was something that the Holy Spirit birthed. And so, today, I want to remind you one last time of something through the years I have shared a few times. Because this is what we aspire to be, and I can tell you over the last many years since we have been the Potter's House, it has been an ongoing fight and struggle to stay focused on the why. And that's true, I think, in any church. But there's always distractions, and some extraordinary distractions that most of you know nothing about. But God's faithful. And what I want to remind you of today, we have been a place where broken vessels are made new. There'll come a time in not too distant future, those words will say, the broken made whole. Same message. And so, today I want us to do what I did a long time ago, many years ago. I want you to walk with me through a passage of Scripture in the Old Testament in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18, 1. I want to remind you, one of the values of uh, the church is process. Most people despise process. People try to create their own process. What this is and what God does in our lives if we are submissive to him is process. You know, I've told you before, probably 34 years ago, I felt called, I felt a burden, I felt a calling to this area. I thought I would look and see where there wasn't a church of God in the region. And I went and uh, met with those over me and said, I want to I wanna come plant a church in Dublin because there wasn't a church of God there. And I was greeted with hurrahs and, and yes and uh, I was sent to another office, and they offered me money to help me do that. I went home, and I got a phone call, and I had an individual in authority say to me, you cannot come to Columbus because some of the pastors here don't want you in Columbus. And I was very distraught. For the next two hours I was driving to preach somewhere, I thought of what I was going to do. And it would have all been wrong, but it felt good to think about for a minute. And I ended up going to Cincinnati, and I go back to those words that were spoken to me in 1986, that I would be in a vineyard for a course of time. And four years later, I came to Columbus. I remember driving with Mark Reed in Dublin, actually. We had been to the uh, Memorial Golf Tournament. And the sun was shining. We were driving, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you arrived here on time. And I thought to myself, I could have pushed the door open. You know, we do that a lot and call it the Lord. I could have pushed that door open, and it would have been catastrophic. It would have been catastrophic for me and anybody I tried to reach to, but process. God put me through process to where I could learn things that were going to be priceless to me in the journey. And so, this is process. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, arise and go down to the potter's house, and there... 
I will cause you to hear my words. It's fascinating to me that the potter was not preaching a verbal message. But God told Jeremiah, go down there and watch him and hear. God says, I'm going to preach to you through this potter, the word of the Lord. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred, it was corrupt, it was ruined. The word means injured, lost, and wasted. The vessel that was in the potter's hand on the wheel was messed up. Can anybody in this room say that was me? And it was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel or a different vessel. As it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord. Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, So are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Now, the Bible teaches us first that which is spiritual and afterward that which, or first that which is natural and afterward that which is spiritual. What God is saying to Israel, he also says to his church. And the message that you and I have to understand as believers is the process of God. And what I believe we need to understand as a church, and again, After 29 years of pastoring here, and and about 25 of those being the potter's house, I have learned the challenge of remaining focused because things happen that draw your time, draw your attention. For, For us, this is what God calls us to be, a place where broken vessels are made whole. Now, the Bible said in, in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scripture might have hope. So the Bible teaches whatever was written before in the Bible is there for you and I to learn. And so is the, so is the case in Jeremiah chapter 18. He went down to the potter's house where he might hear the word of the Lord. And as the potter worked his work on the wheel, what the prophet saw was a broken, ruined, wasted, corrupt vessel that was on the wheel in the potter's hands. The whole point of that is he's not through with you yet. You know, when... when, Children are little, they sang that old song that said, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. He's not through with you yet. And Jeremiah saw this as he watched the potter work the work on the wheel. So what I want you to do with me today is let's go down to the potter's house. And I want to begin with a place called the potter's field. It was originally a place where in in those days and in most settings, a potter at that time would go and be somewhere in the vicinity of a river or a creek where they could access mud. The potter's field was a place where potters would go and, and find mud to work their work on the wheel. If you are familiar with the story in Matthew 27, Judas has betrayed the Lord. And he did it for 30 pieces of silver. And the Bible said that when he saw what he had done, he came back to those religious leaders and he said, I've betrayed innocent blood. And he took that 30 pieces of silver and threw it on the ground in front of them. And he went and hanged himself. Those religious leaders said, what is this to us? And, And they gathered this money up and decided with that money that was given to betray Jesus, to buy a potter's field. And the scripture said that it would be a place where they would bury strangers. 
and the poor. The Greek word that was used means the unheard of. People that didn't know anything about them, they would bury them in the potter's field. It was a place of broken dreams. In the book of Job, chapter 16 and verse 12, he said, all was well with me. In other words, I was doing great. But he, speaking of the enemy, shattered me. He took me by the neck and he crushed me and he made me his target. That happens to real people in real life. The psalmist said in Psalm 31, I am like a dead man. I'm forgotten as a dead man and as a a broken vessel. Now, a broken vessel cannot be used for the original purpose it was created for. And I want you to understand today, and especially if you're listening to me and you don't know Jesus Christ, and you're measuring your life the way the world measures a life. Maybe you feel like you got a little bit of money, or maybe you got a little bit of success, or maybe you got some friends. Maybe you've got a career, and you feel like, man, I, I'm, I'm really moving in the right direction. When in reality, you were originally created for a divine purpose. God had a plan. But just like David, there's so many people can say, I'm, I'm like a broken vessel. This vessel can never be used for what it was created for, unless a master potter can put it back together. Sin shatters us. You can't keep making the same wrong choices and expect a whole and healthy outcome. Broken, shattered pieces. Other people can relate to this. This is cracked and broken. Can't hold any water because there's holes in it. You know what happened to this? This was put on a wheel and it was molded, but there were bubbles or or some imperfection that was in this. And then it went into the fire and it couldn't stand the fire because of the imperfections. And this is what happened. And there's too many people, too many times, that instead of surrendering to the hands of the potter and surrendering to the potter's plan, we try shortcuts. We try to get by without allowing the potter to mold us and make us and to deal with our imperfections. And everything's fine because we know how to act. We know how to talk. We know how to play the part. But suddenly, when you get in the fire, it didn't happen the way you thought it would And this happens to you. Why? Because you didn't surrender to process. All the self-made preachers that I know in my life, that I've met in my life, that didn't surrender to process, and they ran headlong into it, and this is what happened to them and oftentimes their family or their marriage. This happens in life all the time. We get busy with our job. We get busy with our stuff. Somehow or other, we think we know better than God. And we don't let God deal with us where we need to be dealt with. And we rush the process. And then we want to blame the devil when this happens. Now, it's another thing about broken pieces. You know, you can't see God make the broken whole or new if there are no broken people. Are you listening to me? You know, over the years I have watched, I have watched when certain sins that people had in their life came into church. And a lot of church folks, no, let them go someplace else. Let, let, Lord, we can't have somebody like that in the church. How can you expect for the broken to be made whole if if people aren't welcoming the broken people? 
You know, early on when we were, we were moving into trying to be who God called us to be, I'll never forget getting a phone call from a woman. And she said to me, my daughter got saved. She was a stripper. She, she danced and stripped on a pole in a strip joint. But she got saved. And the lady said to me, can she come to your church? And I said, well, absolutely. What kind of question is that? She said, well, they won't let her come to my church. And I said to her, is that still going to be your church? What kind of church wouldn't let somebody? I remember going down to a, a court hearing where, and I, my mind is, I'm not drawing the name, but the judge would bring in ladies that were in trouble that had been, help me, catch court. The judge invited me down there, and I was sitting there, and they had these ladies with stories that came in, and he was trying to get them whole. And there was a, there was a, a girl there, and she told her story, and it was, it was a horrifying story of pain and shame. And when I was walking out of the courtroom, I'll never forget, she came and stopped me, and she said, can I come? And she did come here for a while, and she moved somewhere. But she said, can, can somebody like me? come to your church? And I said, oh, there's all kinds of people like you who were broken and shattered. And in this world, there's no help, there's no hope. But what God specializes in, and I tell you this today, what God has called this church to, and the challenge is to stay on that track what God has called us to is people like this. And you can't have people like this if the righteous people are whispering about them every time they walk down the hallway. Amen and amen. Shattered pieces, broken pieces. And a broken, shattered vessel has no hope. Hopelessness overwhelms multitudes. The Bible said in Job 7 and 6, he said, my days are spent without hope. In Job 19 and 10, he said, my hope has been removed like a tree. He paints this word picture of a tree being ripped up by its roots and carried away. And he said, that's what happened to my hope. I look in the Word of God and I read about somebody like Peter who when he could have shown the brightest in Luke 22, when he could have shown the brightest before the Lord, he failed him. Is there any people ever failed in this room today? He failed him and the Bible said he went out and he wept until he couldn't weep anymore. And I'm telling you there are people and some of you are sitting right here in this room You've got pain so deep that you would never talk about it. You'd never tell anybody about it. You got scars on your life. You got things you went through, things that happened to you. And you find yourself broken and shattered on the inside. And you think, if I can just make it a little further, I'm going to be all right. Somehow I'm going to be okay. I'm just not going to tell anybody about it. But I've come to tell you today, if you got this on the inside of you, there is help for you. There is hope for you. Come on, somebody, and say amen. The Bible said in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 21, this I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, and therefore will I hope in him. Hallelujah. In a hopeless world, in a hopeless time, there is a strong, real, powerful hope that God gives to a human being being. Jeremiah 14 and 6, he said, oh, the hope of Israel, the Savior thereof in the time of trouble. Hope. Romans 15, 13 said, the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the Holy Ghost. I want you to shout out loud, I've got hope. I got hope. 
And if you're like this, if this is how your life is, I'm telling you what God will do. And I'm telling folks who are a part of this church, this is what God has called us to be about. You got hope. You got help in the midst of brokenness. And then there is the clay. You know, it's, it's fascinating to me that clay is of different colors, different textures. The clay is not the same. There's different clay. Now, when I look into the book, the Bible said he has made us as the clay. Isaiah said, he is the potter, and we are the clay. That's interesting about clay, because clay is diverse. The kingdom of God is supposed to be diverse. You know, years ago, we decided we wanted to be a diverse church, and, and I told you oftentimes a Sunday morning, I was standing in that building down there looking out over a middle-class white church. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I don't remember what I was preaching about. I was getting ready to preach. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, this isn't what the kingdom looks like in this city. Because what we're accustomed to is white churches, black churches, Asian churches, all different kind of churches. And then somehow we think we're all going to go to heaven and and be together. Race tensions in this country are boiling over. Because people can't get along. And God wants there to be a place where the world can look and see that people who are different can get along. And so way back then, I remember when we we started, I started looking around. And anytime somebody that came to church that didn't look like the rest of us, I'd follow up with them. And I'd ask them, what do you think about the church? And you you get the normal churchy answers. It was like, well, well. Uh, we had a great time. It was a nice message. And it's like, okay, let's get past that. And finally, I had a black man say to me, well, if you want the truth, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, well, the, the music's white. The people are white. The pictures are white. And I said, we got white pictures? <laughs> and I went, look, I'll never forget it as long as I live. I went and I looked on our wall. There was a picture of the Last Supper. And there was a bunch of white guys sitting around a table. I called a friend of mine, a pastor at a predominantly black church, and I said, can I come and walk around your building? He said, of course. And I was walking around their building, and there was the Lord's Supper, and guess what it was? There's a bunch of black guys sitting around the table. So I came back and said, we need some new pictures. And I thought it was all going to be grand, but boy, I come to understand the tensions that were there. And over the years, folks mad, well, you know, I think the music's too white, it's too black, it's too this, it's too that. Because we think somehow or other, we got it in our head that it's all supposed to be for us. I get worked up, I want to throw this out there somewhere. (laughs) Better get this out of my hand. We We think it's all supposed to center around us. I don't like those lights. I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like, oh, I better go find a church where I like it. Listen, the only way you're going to find a church that you like, everything, is if you go start a church. You go be the pastor and make it the way you want it to be. Because let me tell you something. If you want to reach a diverse group, not everything in the church is going to be your favorite. Well, amen to myself, because that's truth. But I found there's, there's tensions, there's, there's, there's pressures. But the thing about it is, we've got to come to the place that we understand the master potter is piecing us together. And that person sitting behind you or down the row from you, they may not be like you. They were a different clay. Same potter, same work, same result, 
but they're different than you. Are, are you listening to me? The clay was diverse. Now, when the potter looks at the clay, when he sits down, he sees something in clay that he is going to bring out of the clay. I remember multiple times I've read the story of Michelangelo and his seven foot tall masterpiece, David. Two others worked on this for some years, Augustino and Rosalino. They had tried and stopped for 26 years. This huge piece of marble, one piece, where someone had started digging out around the legs, it lied dormant for 26 years until a master potter came by, a master sculptor. And what he saw in that blob of marble was a masterpiece. And for two years, he chiseled away at that marble because he knew David was in there and he was trying to let him out. And I'm telling you, when God sees you, and we need to understand this, that's why so much patience is required. Because there's times people come along and and maybe they're not moving as swiftly as others want. Maybe they're not behaving the way that other people want to. But you've got to understand it takes a little time to do a masterpiece. And there's times that God looks at you and other people look at you and they see a failure. Other people look at you and they see somebody that's weak. Other people look at you and say there's no future. But God may look at you and say I see a prophet there. God may look at you and say I see a business person there. God may look at you and say I'm going to trust you to raise somebody that's going to impact a nation. Uh, God may look at you, and while nobody else can see it, God sees a masterpiece, and he is intent on letting that you out. Hallelujah. But the clay is all different. It, 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 it looks different. Romans 9, 21 said this. Does the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery? For noble purposes and some for common use. The answer to that question is yes. The potter can make whatever the potter wants to make. But know this. Jeremiah 29, 11. Most of us can quote this. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans, that's intentions, thoughts, purposes. To prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. But you got to understand, the clay, when the potter starts to work on it, the potter's already got a plan. When it said a hope and a future, you look for, at this yourself. The word means a, a cord as an attachment. So here's what I know about this. When I was born, there was something attached to me that I couldn't see, that I didn't know about. But it kept pulling me forward. Even before I knew the Lord, there was a purpose. Are you listening to me? Before you knew God, there was a purpose for your life. And it was pulling you through life. Oh, I should have started earlier. I should have surrendered earlier. But I went deeper into darkness. But you know what? That cord was attached to me. It just kept pulling me back. It kept pulling me toward him. And you have a hope and a future. You have something connected to your life that God is pulling you forward. You can resist it. You can run from it. You can try to short circuit his plan or his process. But the fact of the matter is it is connected eternally from the beginning. Until you die, it's connected to you. Because it is the plan and the purpose of the potter. And then Psalm chapter 40, verse 1, I I cried to the Lord and he heard my cry. And he brought me up. That phrase means to ascend or to climb. I was so deep in sin I couldn't climb out. I couldn't fix myself. I don't know about you. Maybe you've been good all your life. But I was in a place I couldn't fix myself. It wouldn't help me getting around other people. 
But he brought you up out of the horrible pit, out of the horrible mud and the miry clay. He reached down and picked up that blob of miry clay attached to you and began to form it and began to make it. And he set my feet on a rock and established my going and put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto God, my goings. And then there is the wedging. When the potter begins to work on the clay, and please hear me, I learned this from the potter. It's called the ram's head method. It is a process of turning, and the head of it looks like a ram. And it's called the ram's head. And the process is to get all the particles of clay flowing together. Getting all of the parts of the clay moving in unison. It's part of the process. And there's times that God begins to squeeze you. And he begins to move. And he begins to mold. And he begins to pull. And he begins to press. We don't like that. We don't like that kind of thing when God does that to us. So we'll resist it. We'll stiffen our neck to it. But I'm telling you, without this, you'll end up like that pot sitting over there, cracked and broken. But what the potter is doing is looking for imperfections. He's looking for something in the clay that needs to be extracted in order for it to be and become what he has willed and designed it to be. Somebody say amen if you understand that. Wedging. And the ram, it's called, that's what it's called, is the ram method. And we know in the scripture that the ram speaks of obedience. In Genesis 22, when Abraham ascended the mountain in Moriah at the direction of God, thinking that he was going to offer his son, there was a ram caught in the thicket. And then the Bible says this in the book of Psalm 37, verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord. Now we think, because we are in this Western mentality of Christianity, that if we, delight, if we just worship God and delight in Him, that you'll have the desires of your heart. That is, that God's going to give you whatever you want. That's not what it means. Delight, the word means to become pliable. It means to become soft. It means to become, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Not my dream, but yours be done. And suddenly, the clay is soft and pliable. And the potter can begin the processes of making of that clay what is in the heart of the potter to make the vessel what it should be. Now, then to the potter's wheel. By the way, lest I forget, you saw James laboring when he was wedging. And he said, it's, it's, it's laborious. And that is, you do that in a laborious way that your respiration, your, 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 your breath begins to blow out. And don't you understand, when you're going through that hard process, and God is squeezing you, and God is looking at the imperfections to extract them out of your life, that he is breathing on you. Do you remember in the Bible when Jesus came and breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost? There is a process that God wants to work out. And here's what i got to understand. If I'm not willing to be squeezed and pressed, I'm missing that intimate part of the process where he's breathing on me to the wheel. Well, now comes the potter's purpose, the potter's vision. He's going to make us what he wants us to be. Now, Jeremiah 18 and 4 said that the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. As seemed best to him. Now, what happens when the potter begins to work the work. There's something called centering. And so it is one of the most important processes is to get 
the work in the middle of the wheel. Now, in Bible days, the wheel would be made of rock or of stone. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet on a rock and established my going. And because if the peace is not centered, it becomes wobbly as it gets higher and becomes unstable. Does that not explain a lot of things to you about maybe somebody you've met along the way or maybe times in your own life? Not willing to take the time to let the foundation get solid. Not willing to take the time to let God center you and balance you in your life. We want to run ahead. We want to go be what God wants us to be without process. But he would center it, pouring the water upon it. Because how many of you know you can't mold hard clay? Did you hear me? People that want to bypass the Holy Spirit and the Word of God will become hard clay and they'll get broken and fractured. So you have to pour the water upon the work. To keep, to keep the clay soft and pliable, where the hands of the potter can make it what it will be. Now, without the water, again, I learned this from the potter, without the water, there is a friction created between the hands of the potter and the pot. There's so many people who refuse to go all in. And we're living in a day where the idea is just like it's been in other parts of the world that brought spiritual darkness to nations. We want less church. We want less to do with any kind of church. Don't bother me with prayer meetings and presence night. Don't people know I'm busy? And we don't want the water. We don't have time to pray. We don't have time to stay full of the Holy Ghost. And so there's this friction created. When the hand of the potter is trying to get something out of you, trying to make you into something, but you don't have time because you're so busy. You know, people are so busy. And there is a friction that is created between the hands of the potter and the vessel. The water, when it's pouring, represents two things. Number one, it represents the Word of God. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 and 26, he said, Husband, love your wife as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify it and cleanse it by the washing of water by the Word of God. So what he does, he pours water upon us when he's making us, when he's molding us. The Word of God is paramount. He said he sanctifies his church. He makes his church holy. He sets his church apart for a holy purpose. And he cleanses it to make pure. Listen to me. You can't be exposed to the Word of God on a regular basis and be out clubbing with people trying to go home with somebody. I don't know what the old people do. You just walk around Walmart maybe looking for somebody to hook up with if your heart's not, I don't know. But you can't be in the presence of the Word of God all the time in your life and go out and do junk like that. You know why? Because the Word of God is like water pouring on you to make you pure by the washing of water. The word means to take a bath. Literally what we do, we take a bath in the Word of God. Psalm 119, he said two powerful things in verses 9 and verse 11. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to his word. And then he said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. His word. His word. Forever, O Lord, Psalm 119, 89, your word is settled in heaven. Psalm 119, 105 said, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119, 130, at the entrance of your word is light and understanding to the simple. 
So the water represents the Word. It represents the Holy Spirit. Now, Isaiah 44 and 3 said, I'll pour water upon him that's thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I'll pour out my spirit. The word means to gush out. That's what happened here last night in the ladies' conference. They had a, they had a gush out. Floods upon the dry ground. I'll pour out my spirit on your seed and my blessing upon your offspring. The Spirit of God is likened unto water. Hosea 6 and 3 said, He shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain to the earth. Proverbs 1, 23, I will pour out, I will gush out my word unto you, and you shall know my word and shall do it. Pour out my Spirit unto you, and you'll know my word, and you shall do it. What happened in John chapter 7, verse 37, the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. And he that believeth on me, as the Scripture said, then out of his belly shall flow rivers. Everybody say rivers. Shall flow rivers of living water. And this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. So God takes us in our brokenness. He takes us in our messed up places. All different kinds of clay. And he puts us to his wheel. And he squeezes and stretches us. With drawing the imperfections and things that do not belong. He pours his water upon us. While he works us on the wheel. And this what the potter is doing here is called throwing. He's raising it. He's, and remember, he established my going, the psalmist said. It means to erect, to form. This is what God does to us. He's throwing the vessel. He is now beginning to define and beginning to form and to raise and stretch what the vessel will be and what it will become. And his mark, his hands are on you. Oh, my brothers and sisters, I, you know, I, I feel in my heart I'm talking to somebody, you just, you just stand at arm's length. You're not sold out. You're not totally given because after all, there's life to live. I'm telling you the greatest life you can live is to be what God created you to be. Come on, somebody, and say amen to that. And so when he, when he has formed the vessel, and he has raised it, and it is what it is to become, he begins to trim away the excess, and he begins to prepare the vessel to be put into the fire. We don't like the fire much. The fire is not pleasant. Think it not strange, Peter said, these fiery trials, as though some strange thing has happened to you. But he goes on to say, and I want you to hear me, but rejoice. What happens when you're in the fire? He said, Rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad with great joy. Because you know what's going to happen? In this process, when he begins to take you off the wheel and move you to the fire, don't think it strange, the fiery trials. Rejoice, because there's coming a time that the glory of the Lord is going, going to appear. And I'm telling you, there's some of you that in your life, you've gone through these processes with God. And you've come to the place that you went through the fire. And then God began to get glory out of your life. Not walking around saying, hey, everybody, look at me. When I see somebody that is so consumed with themselves, that is a sure sign they've not gone through God's process. 
Because if you go through God's process and the loving potter sets you into the fire, by the time you come out of that, you're just looking to give glory in one direction, and that is to God. And you will rejoice because His glory will be revealed in you. Paul, they're going to stone you and discard you outside the city like an animal. That's fire. That's horrible to have to go through that. (laughs) But Paul, the next day, you're going to get up and go right back into the mouth of that thing and preach revival and see the power of God continue to move. Peter, you're going to mess up, man. You're going to mess up when you should have shown the brightest. And you blew it. And now you're going to go out and cry until you can't cry anymore. But hang on, Peter. You get through the fire, and you're going to preach, and 3,000 is going to get saved. And 5,000 is going to get saved after that, just counting the men. Come on, somebody, and hear what I'm saying to you. This is the power of the fire. Stephen, you're going to preach and you're going to get stoned. It's going to be fire. It's going to be hard. But Stephen, you're going to have the pleasure and the privilege of looking up and watching the heavens roll back like a scroll and see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father because there's something about it. When the potter puts his work into the fire, The potter is always watching. The potter is always seeing. The potter is always looking. You're never alone. And the promise of the potter who put you in the fire, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, said there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you're able. But will with the temptation also make a way of escape. God's not going to give you more than what you're able to bear. God's not going to let the fire consume you until you cannot survive. The Bible in Titus chapter 2 talked about we've been purified to be a peculiar people. In our vernacular, peculiar is strange, but the Greek word literally means to be around. So God says you're going to be redeemed, my peculiar people. In other words, it's a people that he is always around. And even though it may be lonely in the fire, even though it may be hard in the fire, the potter is standing by. And he's ready, if you need rescued, to pull you out of the fire. And when the fire is done, Romans 8, 28 said, For we know that all things work together for good to them that are called According to his purpose. He defined his purpose in verse 29. It was to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's what he's called us to. And even though the fire is hard. It's his work. And when the fire is over. He's ready to take his work. His prize. And set it out now to be seen. And to be used. Because listen. Romans 9.21 says the potter has the right to make something of common purpose. Or noble purpose. He's the one that defines what it's going to be. And the same thing is true with you. He might have made you to be a missionary. He might have made you to be a business person. Making lots of money to finance the kingdom. He may have made you to be a, a, a prayer warrior. That nobody ever sees, but intercedes in her closet or his closet. He might make you to be a president, a ruler of a nation. He might make you to be somebody that's going to impact the world. But whatever he makes you, he might make you be somebody that labors in a local church, trying to make the church ministry go and be effective in reaching people. But whatever he makes you to be, you are his prize. Come on, somebody, and say amen. And you need to praise him for whatever he made you to be. And if he didn't make you to be what you wanted to be, 
that you get rid of your plan and say, Jesus, I thank you for the plan that you had for my life. And there's two things I want to share with you. On the bottom of this pot is the mark or the signature of the potter. For as long as this vessel can operate and be what it was designed to be, it will carry the mark and the signature of the potter. Dear God, help me. Because there's going to be times in your life that after you've gone through the processes of God, that still things may get hard and there may be lonely nights. I'm going to testify this to you because I'm, I'm going to be shifting my position and relationship here. Oh, I'll still be around. You can't get rid of me. But I'm going to tell you this. There's been nights when I was in here that I felt like I couldn't survive the night as being pastor of this church. There's been times that sleep ran from me. There's been times that the hounds of hell came in the night. And there's times after I've sat over here that I didn't know if I was going to make it. And I didn't want to do what I was called to do anymore. But you always carry that. The the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And I'm telling you in those hard times, in those hard times when, when you don't know if you want to do it anymore, in those hard times where you don't have the desire maybe to go to church and be what God has set you to be, In those times, in those times when you're pastoring and there's nobody there, you're surrounded but you're a lonely man. When you feel like you can't go further, you're marked, you're possessed, you don't belong to yourself. You've been redeemed, come on somebody and say amen. You've been redeemed and the last thing I want to share with you. When the potter is wedging the clay and working on the clay, there are little flakes of the potter's hand that moves into the clay. So that the clay, when it reaches its final place, has got the DNA of the potter built in. (laughs) Oh, That's why you're not your own. And God will never put you in a position that you cannot overcome and that you cannot succeed because his DNA is in you. The blood of the holy God of almighty heaven and earth and all of the universe is resident inside of you. Turn around and tell somebody I got his DNA in me. There's two things I want to do here right now. Number one, if you're here in this room and you're not saved, and you're a player, or you're halfway in and halfway out, God's got some beautiful thing he wants to do in your life, but it will never happen as long as you're playing. But I promise you, you surrender yourself to him and you surrender to his process, there'll come a time that you're going to look back and see how far you've come. And you're going to wonder, how did I get here? How did I get here? But it all begins if you're shattered and broken and you've made a decision, I can't climb out. I can't help myself. I can't do this by myself. How do I get from this to this? You got to surrender to God. And while people are praying all over this room, this is the choice, by the way. Which would you rather be? Would you like to do it the way the world does it and they hide behind faces that smile and they have to have things to make them feel better? Or would you rather be this? That's the ultimate choice you make in life. 
If you're here in this room and you say, Pastor, I'm not, I'm not where I need to be with God. I'm not saved. I got sin in my life. I want to surrender to God and be what he wants me to be. If that's you, just very simply, if you're saying, I want you to pray for me, I want you to hold your hand up right where you're at right now in Jesus' name. I know God has a plan for me. God bless you. Put your hand up and just keep it up for a second if that's you. And if that's you, the Spirit of the Lord is dealing with your heart right now. That's how you're going to know. Put your hand up. Anybody else? Anybody else? Hold your hand up high because we want to pray with you today. Hold your hand up high and keep it up. Anybody else? Anybody else? If you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. I want you to come down, right down here real quick. Not, this is not to embarrass you. This is to say, come on, let's, let's do this for real. Let's not play. There's no secret agents in the kingdom. If you raised your hand or you didn't, and you should have, I want you to get out from where you're at sitting right now. Matter of fact, everybody stand with me, please. I want to ask you to get out from where you are and come right down here. If, if you say, well, I don't know that. Just turn around to somebody and say, will you go with me? I promise you somebody will go with you. If you lifted your hand and you want to do this for real, come forward right now. We're going to get that fixed in the name of Jesus. Church, pray with me for just a minute. For just a minute. I'm going to wait until the Holy Spirit releases me. If that's you, and if you raised your hand or if you didn't, then you should have. Get out from where you're at right now and come and let him do what he wants to do. God bless you, man. Take me in your hands. God bless you. Yeah, come on. I'm willing and waiting to give you what you want from me. You know, it's because he loves you so much. He's not going to let you come in a place like this and not confront you with his grace. Amen. I don't know what this looks like in your life. Is there anybody else? Yeah. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. I don't know what this looks like in your life. I don't know what it looks like when God has done what he wants to do in you. I don't know exactly what that looks like but I'd like to see it, and I think you would too. You know, we're living in a world that is growing more and more anti-Christ, more and more anti-God, and unfortunately, that's crept into churches even. But I'm telling you for real, if you give it to him and you become clay in the potter's hands and he puts you on his wheel and he begins to mold and make you you will be stunned. I promise you. You'll be stunned what happens in the end. It'll blow your mind. And I promise you, you will never, as long as you live, regret letting God do that. You believe that? You believe it? You believe it, sis? You believe it, man? You believe it? You believe it? So, I want to I wanna lead you in a prayer. And this, these, these words will, will have no impact on you if it's not your heart. I mean, you're in church on a Sunday morning. Do you believe what the Bible said about Jesus Christ? That he's the son of God, died and rose again? Do you believe that? Do you believe it? Do you believe it, man? you believe it? you believe it? Well... To be saved, what I have to do is take what I believe and make a decision. Because the Bible says the demons of hell believe and tremble, but they're not saved. So Romans 10 and 9 said, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and, and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'd be saved. That's why I ask you what you believe. And if you believe he died on the cross and that he rose from the grave, then what God is asking from you is to make a decision to give him control of your life and confess the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you do that, everything changes from the inside and ultimately to the outside. 
things are different. And if you follow him and walk with him through this process, and what you learn about him and how he molds you and makes you, and you get to that process, and there's going to be somewhere along the way you're going to say, man, look how far I've come. I'm not perfect, but look how far I've come. I'm not what I shall be. And you just keep walking with the Lord. And then there comes a point in time that he takes you. And he sets you forth to get glory out of your life. It might be that he just wants you to live a good life of love and purity before him. Loving people. And people look at you and say, what is it about you? I want what you've got. And there you are just experiencing the glory of God that's up to him so I want to lead you in a prayer and again if you mean this it'll change everything if you don't change nothing so I want you to say these words right out loud I want you to tell him God I come to you because of Jesus I need forgiveness I need a savior I believe that Jesus died for me on the cross. And I believe he rose from the dead. And today, I make a decision to give him control of my life. To make Jesus Lord of my life. I'll do what he wants me to do. I'll get back up when I fall down. I renounce the devil. I renounce sin, and I declare Jesus as Lord. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Now, Prosper gave his heart. Amen. Prosper gave his heart to the Lord during worship over here. Thank you, Lord. Now, I want y'all to listen to me. Two things. Number one, the Bible teaches that because of what you just did, that there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God in heaven because of what happened here in this humble setting. And we want to help you grow. We want to help you to be everything God wants you to be. We want to get to know you. We want to love you. We want to watch and see what God does in you. So I'm going to ask you, right over here stands Ryan. Wave at everybody. I want you to go right over there. He's just going to have you fill out a card. It's only going to take 60 seconds. You can take your friend with you. He's ready for you. So if you all just walk right over there, it's not going to take but just a, just a minute. Come on, can we give praise to God for his goodness and his mercy? Now, the last thing I want to do is I want to say to you, What I preached up here is what God has called us to. God's called us to this. This is not easy stuff. And I'm going to talk more about it come here in a couple weeks. But I am so excited about the future of this place. You know, I know people say, well, you know, he's leaving, so I probably should find another church. What if God called you here? I'm telling you, the best is yet to be. And it's time for some of you that's kind of set back to get up and put your hand on the plow because the Lord is coming. I said the Lord is coming. And the Potter's House Church is going to continue to be what it's always been. So I want you to lift your hands to heaven right now. Father, I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for the clarity of your calling in this place. I thank you, Lord, for what you've done and how faithful you've been. I thank you for what you will do and how faithful you'll be. Lord, help us to remember we're so easily distracted. Help us to remember, Lord, there's broken people that need us to go and find them. There's clay that's different than we are, Lord, that you're looking to mold and make. Lord, help us always to understand the power 
being stretched by your hand and the Spirit of God and the Word of God working in tandem in our lives. Help us to understand, Father, sometimes when people go through the fire, that it's not always a pretty sight. But help us to value the fire. Until you start doing in us what we were born to do. Lord, I pray, help us to never short-circuit your process. Help us never take shortcuts into things of God because it doesn't work. But help us walk in your way and help us be who you intended us to be. And Father, we pray that. Let there be an, an ongoing unction and anointing that rests on this place. And we pray that with thanksgiving and joy for what you've done in us. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody in the room shouted amen.